Good afternoon. Thank you so much for inviting me here today to share my story and my views. How did I become a woman in surgery? The pathway is not precise for everyone, but if you chase your light, you will create your own way. So what is light? Light can be defined as a noun or the natural agent that stimulates sight and makes vision possible. Or it can be a verb to make something to start burning, to ignite. I consider the light to be something that ignites a passion in us and drives us to learn all we can to reach our greatest potential. A 15th century proverb reads, the ideal surgeon has the mind of Asclepius, the eye of an eagle, the heart of a lion, and the hands of a woman. Not necessarily the physical characteristics of the woman's hand, but more likely the temperate nature of women. So why do we have to talk about women in surgery or female surgeons? Women have been performing surgery for over 5,000 years. However, they were forbidden to practice surgery in the Middle Ages. In the 19th century, Dr. James Berry was found to be a woman only after she died. In the 1970s, 6% of all U.S. medical students were women, and today, 51% of the medical school classes are made of women. However, only 19% of American surgeons are women. And as you see on the slide, this was taken two years ago in our operating room where the entire team that day was full of women. So why are there fewer women in surgery than men? Despite the interest in surgery uh, that women have, and the fact that female doctors perform equally well as their male counterparts in terms of knowledge and skills, judgment and professionalism, women are not actively encouraged to pursue surgical training because of social perceptions of women's abilities and gendered stereotypes. And you see this on the slide behind me, which I actually took from Facebook. Surgical training is, has long been viewed as only belonging to an old boys club and incompatible with combining a surgical lifestyle with the prospect of starting a family. Surgical training is uh, thought of as being highly demanding and very competitive. There are also ideas about the required personality and required strength of a surgeon. And finally, there's been a lack of female role models in surgery. We, as women, have some fears. So we have, on a professional level, a fear of not being considered equal. For example, if there is a complication from surgery, referrals to female surgeons plummet by 54% when there's only a small drop in those for men. On a personal level, we are afraid that we may be alone. And if we're not alone, we fear that we may not be able to successfully balance a career and the responsibilities of our families. We know that female surgeons are more likely to be married to full-time professionals, and that we will, of course, take over a large portion of the, the, the domestic chores. In fact, women will spend up to an entire work week or 39 hours a week on domestic chores. So how did I become a surgeon? I followed a series of lights. I was raised in a small town outside of Augusta, Maine with my younger sister, by my mother, a, a, an immigrant from South Korea, who attended nursing school when I was seven uh, years old, and my father, a US Army officer. And from a very young age, I was taught that education is the key to success. 
When I was in the seventh grade, as you can see from this beautiful picture of me on this side, I loved math, and the math team was my passion. Around the same time, I dreamed of attending Harvard and becoming a doctor. But I didn't know anybody who went to Harvard, and I didn't know any doctors. Even my most favorite teacher suggested those goals might be too lofty. But I was not discouraged. I thought, these are possible. I was chasing my lights. When I started high school, I became fascinated by Latin. I remember sitting on the floor in the corner of my bedroom, immersed in reading Latin language, Roman mythology, life and customs. Studying was not work. It was fun. My Latin teacher introduced us to the Junior Classical League and took us to conventions where there was something for everyone, academic tests, Olympics, and even dances. There were also leadership opportunities. And I remember attending my very first national convention when I was a freshman in high school with 1,500 other Latin students and looking up on the stage and thinking, that would be amazing to be the national president. I talked to my Latin teacher who said, oh no, <laughs> that's not possible. I will never sponsor a student for that role. But nevertheless, I involved myself as deeply as I could in JCL because I loved it. And in my senior year of high school, a little nervous, but buoyed by the support of my Latin teacher, my classmates, and my sister, who had confidence in me even when I sometimes lacked it, I ran for and was elected the national JCL president. This experience single-handedly changed my life. I had a dream that I was told was impossible, yet I had a passion for this subject area and this organization. And I involved myself as deeply as possible because I loved it. I was chasing a light and I didn't even realize it. Serving in this role allowed me to develop self-confidence and leadership skills that I use even to this day. Blessed by this election, I was admitted to Harvard, and this was most likely the reason why. And I decided to pursue my dream of becoming a doctor, and I majored in biology because I was truly fascinated by human anatomy. But I had to pay for it. I applied for and uh, was awarded a four-year United States Air Force ROTC scholarship. Now, in high school, no one would have ever thought that I would join the military. I attended Latin and math meets. I was not a three-sport varsity athlete. In fact, when I arrived for ROTC, my push-ups were so weak that I was told, you ain't gonna make it, cadet. <laughs> Undeterred and actually motivated by that comment, I began to chase that light. I pushed myself to run many miles in combat boots and to do countless push-ups. After my sophomore year of college, I had to attend mandatory field training. And on the bus ride to upstate New York, I cried. I actually thought I would fail. But I said, I'm going to take one step at a time, set small physical goals for myself, and I committed myself to being a team player. But as each day passed, I found that I was reaching my personal challenge goals. And by the end of the month, I not only survived, I was ranked the top cadet in the camp and in the country that year. In my senior year of college, I took a vertebrate surgery course, which truly captivated me. So when I applied to medical school and I was interviewed at the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine where I, where I eventually enrolled, I was asked by a female pediatrician, what are you interested in? I said, surgery. She said, oh no, you won't become a surgeon. You don't have the personality for it. You're too nice. So I started medical school and I thought, okay, I, I'm not going to become a surgeon. And at the time, I also had a very serious boyfriend. And I thought, 
well, in my future two physician household, my career will have to take a back seat because I will assume the majority of child care responsibilities. I was making decisions without an engagement ring, a marriage, or actual children. So when that relationship ended, my ambition to become a surgeon was unbridled. During my surgical clerkship, I absolutely had a fabulous time. I enjoyed the technical aspects of surgery, the need to make emergent decisions, and the camaraderie of the team, of guys. I was used to working with guys in ROTC, and I thought, I can handle a male-dominated field. But then I began to doubt myself. I thought, what would nurses and doctors think of me? And would I have to look like a man and talk like a man and act like a man to be successful? And would I work such countless long hours that I would never get married and have children? I decided to take an advanced clerkship in surgery, and this is where I met Ann Fisher, MD, PhD, my chief surgical resident. She was very smart, but also feminine and kind. And I thought, I could be like her. One day, she pulled me aside and she said, Kim, you just have to do it. It's a lot of sacrifice in your 20s and 30s, but it's worth it. She had confidence in me, but I was still afraid. I didn't know if I'd make it through residency. I didn't know if patients would like me and would physicians refer to me. These were questions that were posed to me by my mother, a nurse. My father, who has absolutely no medical background, said to me, Kimberly, if I were a patient, I would want you as my surgeon. So after careful reflection and with the passion and self-confidence from JCL and ROTC, the promise of helping people to get better, and the challenge of fulfilling my greatest potential, I took the leap of faith. I applied for general surgery and matched at the University of California, San Francisco. I then transferred to the Brigham and Women's Hospital where I was trained by Dr. Michael Zinner, a pioneer in mentoring female surgeons. So what is a mentor? A mentor is somebody who guides you and advises you and sometimes will put your career in front of his or hers. Often assigned, most mentors are sought. I have been blessed with the mentors that you see above, from Johns Hopkins, UCSF, the Brigham and Women's Hospital, and Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, where I trained in surgical oncology. A few women and many men, they have treated me with respect and provided me with opportunities. The more mentors you have, the greater variety of perspective and advice that you will receive. All it takes is a little courage to seek them out and to cultivate the relationships. After my surgical oncology training, it was time to repay my Air Force service commitment. And when my son was 10 months old, I was deployed to Afghanistan, absolutely heartbroken that I would miss his first birthday. When I arrived, I was asked to perform surgery on this 10-month-old baby boy who had a tumor the size of a soccer ball in his abdomen. I told my superiors, I'm not trained to operate on babies. And they said, it's you or it's no one. So I reached out to my mentor, Ann Fisher, now a pediatric surgeon, and armed with the advice that everything in a baby is small and keep the baby warm, I enlisted the help of my trauma colleague and together we removed this tumor. One week later, he was recovering very well and eating Cheerios and bananas, just like all American children do. 
Imagine the light. It was like the heavens opened their doors. I, a female surgeon, performed surgery on a 10-month-old baby boy my son's age during a war in one of the most dark times personally of my life. This was the most meaningful professional experience I have had in my life. The tumor was benign, and now this boy is a healthy 12-year-old living in Houston, Texas, and I keep in touch with his father on Facebook. Being a surgeon is an absolute privilege and brings me tremendous joy and meaning. There is no stronger relationship than that between a surgeon and a patient. They literally put their lives in our hands. While I absolutely love my job and my team at work, the most important part of my life is my family. I am truly blessed to have a supportive husband, two wonderful children, my parents, my parents-in-law, my sister, and my children's nanny. They all provide for me a support that we all need to be successful. You can make a difference. Chase your light. Thank you.